Let's work on part two, JWT generation. Again, this process is very straightforward. Once part one, the HTTP basic authentication is successful, auth controller, auth service, and JWT provider will work together to generate and return user info and the JSON web token. Before we move on, let's talk about what JWT is and why it is popular. JSON Web Token, or JWT, is a compact format for safely sharing information between parties. You don't have to worry about the information in a JWT is modified during transmission, since this information can be verified and trusted because it is digitally signed. JWTs can be signed using either a secret or a public-private key pair using RSA. In this project, we will use public-private key pair to digitally sign our JWT. A JSON web token looks like this. While this looks like gibberish, it is actually a very compact, printable representation of a series of claims in this red portion and purple portion, along with a signature, look at the blue portion, to verify its authenticity. A JSON web token consists of three elements separated by dots, which are the header, the payload, and the signature. At this moment, we as human beings cannot understand anything about this token. So let's try to decode it. I have already copied this JWT, and let's go to an online JWT decoder. OK, here we are. Let me paste the JSON web token here. After decoding, you can clearly see the three elements, the header, the payload, and the signature. The first two elements, the header and the payload, are JSON objects. Those key value pairs are called claims. Claims are statements about an entity typically a user, and additional data. Look at the header. It specifies the algorithm and token type. In this case, there is no token type, only the algorithm, ALG. The header session has one claim, ALG. It tells us the algorithm being used to sign this JWT. In this case, it is RS-256, which stands for RSA signature with char 256. The second element of this token is the payload, which contains many interesting user data in those claims. In this example, there are five claims. ISS stands for issuer, sub stands for subject. EXP means expiration time. So the number here is really the seconds since epoch. IAT means issued at time. So the value here is also seconds since epoch. Authorities tells us that this user has two roles, admin and user. If you move your cursor over to IAT, issued at, you will find that this is the time that this GWT is signed. And here, EXP tells us when it expires. So the lifetime of this JWT is all in two hours. After this time, this JWT is considered as invalid and cannot be used for authentication purpose. To create the signature element, the blue part, you have to base64 URL encode the header and the payload, and then take the encoded header, the encoded payload, a secret like a private key, and use the signing algorithm specified in the header to sign this token. So let's go back to the slides, and I will show you how this token is created step by step. To create a signed JWT, first, we need to get our claims. This claim is about the signing algorithm, 
we're using RS-256. This is the payload. As you can see, there are five claims. These two JSON objects are then base64 URL encoded. And here are the results. Then we need to join these two strings with a dot. Here is the result. Now we're ready to sign this token. This string and a private key will go into a signing algorithm, in this case, RS-256. The output is the signature. The signature is base64 URL encoded. And finally, we will join the encoded signature string and this string with a dot. Here is the final signed JSON web token. The last element of a signed JWT, that is the signature here in blue color, is incredibly useful and important. It is used to verify that the message was not changed along the way. And in the case of tokens signed with a private key, it can also verify that the sender of the JWT is who it says it is. Feel free to pause the video and make sure you understand the process of creating a signed JWT. Here is a caveat. Even though a JWT is encoded, it is not encrypted. Although it is protected against tampering, it is readable by anyone. You just saw that. I pasted a JWT into an online decoder, and we can get all the claims back. So do not put secret or sensitive information in the payload or header elements of a JWT unless it is encrypted using something called JWE or JSON Web Encryption. In this project, we're not using this encryption. In the end, let's talk about why should we use JSON Web Tokens. It seems like HTTP basic authentication works very well. A user logs in, the server creates a session in the primary memory to store the user's login status, and then sends back the J session ID in a cookie. Subsequent requests can use this cookie to prove that the user has logged in. It works very well. Then why should we switch to JWT authentication? Why bother? There is a problem with sessions, that is, the server needs to create a session for each logged-in user in the primary memory. If there are a lot of logged-in users, that will eat up a big chunk of the server's memory. On the other hand, if you are using JWT, by putting users' basic login information, this does not include any sensitive information like password, in a token and send with every request, there's no need to maintain sessions in the primary memory on the server side anymore. This can save a lot of RAM when there are many logged-in users. Second, with JWTs, servers can be scaled up easily without the need to share session information across servers. Think about this scenario. If you are using sessions, not JWTs, let's say currently it saves 300 logged-in users in the primary memory. Now we want to add a new server to handle API requests. Unfortunately, this new server session is empty. There's no logged in user at all. So if a previously logged in user's request is handled by this new server, then what happens? The user will be required to log in again, even though this user has already logged in on a different server. So every time we scale up, we need to do something called session sharing. Basically, it means copying and pasting the sessions. This is very tedious and time consuming, and it can quickly get out of sync across all servers because there are so many users to track. If you're familiar with microservices, JWT is a great choice for this architecture than sessions. Since the token can store some basic user information, this can save a few database calls. The server can retrieve the information directly from the claims in a GWT 
rather than querying a database. The token can be used to authenticate users on different servers. In a non-trivial project, there may be different kinds of servers implemented in languages other than Java, for example, Ruby, PHP, or Python. They may support sessions, but they don't support JE session ID. JE session ID is Java only. So if a user logs in on a Spring Boot server and gets this JE session ID in a cookie, it will be useless on a Python server because Python cannot recognize JE session ID. On the other hand, JWT is language neutral, means it can be used across different languages and frameworks. So JWT can be used to implement single sign-on or SSO. Last but not least, JWT allows for a dedicated authorization server that can be solely responsible to issue tokens. And this is a very common practice in a modern enterprise application. I hope now you have a better understanding about JSON Web Token. Next, let's move on to part two, JWT generation. We will learn how to generate a JSON Web Token in Spring Boot. See you in the next video.